Good morning, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome back to Law and Crime Live. This is where we cover some of the most interesting live trials in the country today. And today, before I get into our main live trial, before we get into that, and it is the Tex MacGyver case, and there's so much to talk about it, I do want to let our viewers know that, as you know, we covered Friday the David Copperfield case. Now, they are not live today, but hopefully they will be live tomorrow, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, either we'll stream it here on lawandcrime.com or we'll stream it here on the network. We'll try to t tell you when we uh, figure out a better bi uh, video quality for tomorrow. But in the meantime, our focus today is the Tex MacGyver case, and there's so much to talk about. Now, for anybody who's been following this case, this is about that prominent attorney named Tex MacGyver, who's on trial for shooting and killing his wife, Diane MacGyver, by shooting her from the back seat of a moving car. Now, he is saying, his whole defense team is saying, that this was all a tragic accident, but the prosecution is not buying any of that, no. They are saying that he did this intentionally, that he planned this, that he wanted to do this, because of financial gain. He had a financial motive to kill his wife, and we're going to get all into that. Now, where are we right now in the case? Well, the defense rested Friday afternoon. Today, we believe the prosecution will call several rebuttal witnesses to rebut the defense's case. And the defense really did put on a very strong case, a much shorter case than the state, but a strong case nonetheless. Now, uh, we believe that they might put on their own sleep expert. They might recall a financial expert named Dean Driscoll. And they might also call Putnam County Sheriff uh, Howard Sills, who's a friend of Tex MacGyver. Closings in the Tex MacGyver case are set for tomorrow. You don't want to miss anything. The case is coming to a conclusion. After today, we are going to show you so many different replays about this case to, so you can fully understand where we are. But to help us talk about where we are, I have two very special guests to talk about this before we go to the live trial. Again, I'm keeping a very careful eye on the courtroom. As soon as it starts, we'll make sure to go to it. But let's bring in our very special guest for this morning. First, joining me on set is law and crime trial analyst Bob Bianchi. Bob, good to see you. Great to be here, Jesse. And joining me via Skype is the host of the live feed on 11alive.com, somebody who's been following this case every day and knows it, the ins and outs of it, Vinny Politan. Vinny, great to see you. Good morning, guys. Great to see you. All right, guys. So, I'm going to, Vinny, I'm going to start with you. Um, when we talk about where we're at right now, I think the defense has poked a lot of holes in the prosecution's case. I mean, listen, they got two of those influencing witness charges dropped. Now, Mr. MacGyver only faces one of those influencing witness charges. What do you think about where we're at right now? Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about that at, at down here. And really, a lot of people overwhelmingly think that this is now the defense's case to lose at this point as we get closer to closing arguments here. In terms of the top charge, we're talking about murder. And um, it's, it's difficult. You know, it's always difficult to prove a murder case. But here, there are reasonable explanations for a lot of other things that are going on here. And that's been a real problem for prosecutors. And I think it really hit the, the, the pinnacle of, of reasonable explanations for other things that they've been talking about when we had the uh, massage therapist, Texas masseuse, who was wearing those boots uh, testify and gave an explanation. Maybe not everybody bought it 100 uh, percent, but I think it was a reasonable explanation. So I think at this point where we are, murder is an uphill battle for these prosecutors. Uh, they've got to do something really special during their closing argument. Vinny makes a good point. Murder may be an uphill battle, battle but Bob, the judge has allowed uh, lesser charges here. So this means that the, the jury doesn't find Mr. MacGyver guilty of murder. They could find him guilty of involuntary manslaughter due to reckless conduct, which is a felony, and involuntary manslaughter due to criminal negligence, which is a misdemeanor. So what does that mean, if you could explain it to uh, our viewers? So... Under most states' homicide statutes, they have varying levels of conduct upon which a homicide prosecutor can pursue a prosecution. The first and top charge here is what well, we would say in Jersey, but it's pretty similar everywhere else. It's like a purposeful and knowing murder. This is where you intend. This is the state's theory of this particular case. He didn't do it by accident. He intended this to happen. He knew or he should have known that there was going to be a homicide. Manslaughter, as you aptly put, is different. Manslaughter, both voluntary and involuntary manslaughter, is with terms recklessness and negligence. In other words, you didn't mean it to happen. You 
you didn't want it to happen. You didn't intend it to happen. You didn't plan for it to happen. But you acted in such a gross disregard. Now, people use this term recklessness very loosely. Legally, it has a very specific meaning, a substantial and unjustifiable disregard for somebody's safety that leads to their death. So while it wasn't purposeful, it was so obvious. Like, say, for example, Jesse, we're walking down this wet, soggy uh, New York City street today, and I take a gun and I fire around down the street because I'm just having a bad day and it hits somebody. I may not, and kills them. I may not have intended those people to die, but it was such a substantial disregard for their safety. Nevertheless, you're held accountable legally. But this case is interesting because if the defense is theory, and they, you know me, Jess, I, I think the defense has done a phenomenal job. If the defense is successful about this sleep thing and that this was, you know, just kind of something that was a, a, an, an accident, a gun went off, they hit a bump, whatever it may be, that isn't necessarily reckless conduct because the actor didn't actually do something. It was an accident. And that you can be assured is going to be a word that at least I would be using as a homicide defense, a defense attorney, accident, 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 over and over again. And we can't forget that he was initially charged with involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct, and those charges were up to murder. Now, Vinny, I want to stand by because you mentioned the masseuse, and I'm definitely, I'm going to play her testimony right now. This is Annie Anderson, and then we're going to talk about with this with Vinny a little bit about the witnesses that have been called by the defense. So again, this is the testimony of Annie Anderson, the masseuse, brought in by the defense to try to explain, did she have a sexual relationship with the defendant? And remember, the defendant is on trial for his wife's murder. Take a look. Do you have a romantic relationship with sex matter? Never. Massage therapist Annie Anderson took the stand in the murder trial of prominent Atlanta attorney Claude Tex MacGyver. MacGyver stands accused in the shooting death of his wife, Diane. The prosecution believes the defendant had financial motives for the killing, and they even insinuated Anderson had a sexual affair with MacGyver. When pressed on her status as the defendant's alleged lover, Anderson remains steadfast. She massaged the couple. She never had any sexual relationship with Tex. Did you ever touch him sexually? Never. Did he ever touch you sexually? Never. never. Did you ever, at any time, I'm talking about any time, before Diane Charles' death, or after her death, either before September 2016, after September 2016, engage in any sexual conduct, however you want to define it, with Tex MacGyver. Never. On cross-examination, Anderson even kind of admitted she felt intimidated by the prosecution during a pretrial interview. You were persistent about some things that I didn't know anything about. Okay. That just made me uncomfortable, and I remember crying the entire three and a half hours. After that intense back and forth, when jurors were asked to leave the room, the prosecutor kind of backpedaled, claiming he never had any evidence of Tex having an affair with the massage therapist. And to be quite frank with you, um, there is no direct evidence that she had sex with anybody. And so the court is absolutely right. Uh, I would lose all credibility if I stood up in front of this jury in the closing argument and said, oh, the evidence has shown this torrid love affair between, and I'm not going to do that. For Law and Crime, I'm Rachel Stockman. All right, let's try to explain this a little bit. Again, we are waiting for the live feed in the Claude Tex MacGyver case, but uh, this, this masseuse is really an important figure in this case. Uh, so again, I want to bring in Vinnie Politan, host of the live feed on 11alive.com. Vinny, the prosecution can't have it both ways, right? I mean, they want to say, they want to introduce this idea of the masseuse being around after Diane died, but then say, whoa, we're not saying there was an affair. Vinny, what do you think of that? Well, well, he's saying there was no direct evidence of an affair. There was a lot of bizarre behavior, and, and I think, you know, you, you try to gauge what the viewers at home are saying about all this, and a lot of folks are really skeptical. Now, a, a few things. Let's not forget that she's in his bedroom the day that Diane dies and spends the night in his bedroom. That is strange for most people from the outside looking in. Then she's at the ranch a few days later, and there was a witness who had purchased a pair of boots for Diane MacGyver who said, yes, the masseuse, this woman was wearing Diane's boots a couple days after Tex had shot and killed her, and Tex was alone with her at the ranch. Again, you look at that, that does not seem normal. Now, here's what I'm waiting for today in the rebuttal case, because the testimony of this masseuse was that she's a size 10 and a half, 
and she said and testified that Diane was a seven and a half, not based upon measuring her feet, but based upon massaging her feet millions of times is, is what her testimony was. She said, yeah, I've had those, those feet in my hands millions of times. She's a seven and a half. So if there is evidence that Diane MacGyver is something other than a seven and a half, I want to hear it from prosecutors today. So, Bob, is that a big issue of credibility then? <clears throat> Yeah, I guess it is. I, I, I'd be interested to see what Vinny thinks about this. One thing that's concerning to me is I don't even understand why this evidence is being admitted under the rules of evidence in the first place. I get that there is going to be an argument that it's circumstantial evidence to show after act uh, motive somehow that obviously, I mean, he may be having an affair doesn't mean that you committed a murder. Uh, I'm just concerned about this prosecution just throwing every single thing up against the wall. And even if there was a conviction, I think that this is subjected to substantial appellate issues because the bad character evidence rule, Jesse, as you know, prevents, it's, a, it's an actual evidence rule, so your viewers understand, it prevents this kind of information, unless it's solidly in the case and is relevant, and relevance means it goes to prove a fact or prove something within the law that's necessary for the prosecution. And here we have the prosecutor saying, well, I can't sit there and really say they were having an affair or not having an affair. And even if they were having an affair, to me, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the motive. What is the motive here? Is it financial? Is it the affairs or the combination of those things? This prosecution case is like the Chinese menu of options that they're trying to throw out in front of the jury. And you know what that spells for me? Me as a homicide prosecutor for many years of my career, not guilty. We talk about the relevance of witnesses, and, and Vinny, I gotta ask you, this is, this is, I believe, the most important witness, maybe, of the whole case. I'm talking about Ross Gardner, the crime scene analyst who testified uh, on Friday. And what he said was, in his opinion, it is impossible for the gun to be held like this, had to be held like this, had to be held on the lap, was not held in the back seat of, uh, pointed towards the back seat of the car. His testimony, I felt, was so strong for the defense. And at the end of the day, that gun, what happened to the car, is the most important thing. What did you think of Ross Gardner's testimony? Well, well there are a couple of things. First, uh, we saw a prosecutor get very, very animated, very, very aggressive on cross-examination. And there were some things that he testified to that he thought he's trying to surprise him by. That being said, uh, yes, he's an important uh, witness. But don't forget, there was an expert that we heard uh, a few weeks ago from the prosecution who said something different. So we have the classic battle of the experts. And the question is, you know, this jury probably wants to sit in the back seat of that car to figure it out for themselves. Obviously, uh, I don't think the judge is going to allow them to do that. But the, the bottom line is you've got to battle the experts, but you've got common sense also from this jury. They're going to look at the pictures that were taken. They're going to look at the animation, and they're going to rely on their life experience of sitting in the backseat of SUVs. And I think Ross Gardner, I don't know, I liked his demeanor on the stand. I thought he was very believable, but I want our viewers to see a little bit of his testimony. And you can see how he broke it down for the jurors. And remember, this is one of the final witnesses that the jury will hear, and it will probably resonate in their minds. So let's play a little bit of Ross Gardner, and then we'll be back with uh, Bob and Vinny to talk a little bit more about it. That's the testimony of Ross Gardner really testifying for the defense and helping their case that this might have been an accident and was not an intentional shooting. Now, we are talking about the Claude Tex MacGyver case. We do have a live feed right now in the courtroom. I want to do a, a three shot if we can. You can see uh, the live feed in the courtroom before trial actually starts. The attorneys are addressing calling another witness. Uh, I, I think as soon as we get the feed, we'll make sure to go to it. Um, but, Bob, I have a quick question for you as we wait for the feed. Um, as Vinny said, a battle of the experts. How do you do that if you are either the defense or the prosecution? One expert saying one thing, one expert saying another. The defense really said, um, tried to say, Ross Gardner at one point said, look, we're going to have differences, but they're not big differences. But I disagree with the models that were used by the prosecution's expert. And there are differences in the way they analyze this case. That's bad for the prosecution. I mean, when the prosecution is resting its case, we talked about this earlier in the case, based on the ballistics, the forensics, as well as this motive. To me, the motive is filled with a bunch of holes and it's been beaten up and chewed up and knocked out in my mind. Now on the ballistic side, the prosecutor has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 people. You have a battle of the experts, which creates doubt. And that expert was really actually very, very good. I told you in the beginning of this case, Jesse, there is not going to be a ballistics expert that is going to be able to say for the prosecution exactly how the gun was held or exactly the manner in which the gun was fired. This isn't NCIC or any of those other 
all the crazy shows that look at a piece of dirt and tell you, uh, you know, the case is solved through this. That's not the way this works. So in this case, this guy's done a great job in dismantling, once again, the prosecution's expert. It doesn't make a difference if the jury believes the defense expert, so long as they sit there and they say, when it's a battle of the experts, yeah. as Vinny indicates, I don't know who to believe. There's reasonable doubt. Also, as Vinny said, what he hopes today is that there will be some discussion about trying to um, show that Annie Anderson, the masseuse, she might not have been a credible witness. And what you see right now, I'm going to go live into the courtroom, is a discussion about calling a witness to testify about the boots worn. Uh, and that might not have matched the description presented by Miss Anderson, which shows that she might not be a credible witness. Let's listen in right now. Um, well, yeah. Again, that's a live feed in the courtroom. And before trial starts, I do want to bring uh, Vinnie Politan because I had a question about... Um, this was the question, again, about the gun ex the crime scene analyst, Ross Gardner, who testified for the defense. Now, Vinny, my question to you is, even if we take as true what Ross Gardner said, that the gun was sideways, it was resting on Mr. MacGyver's lap, and it was not pressed against the back seat of the car, could the prosecution still frame this as an intentional shooting? Absolutely. And they did. It, it, you recall the animation, the 3D animation. They had two different versions of that animation, one with the gun on the side, sort of like this, and the other with it on the lap. In both cases, obviously, you can take the, the, your finger, put it on the trigger and squeeze the trigger and fire it. So um, I don't think that is the end of the case for prosecutors, the positioning of the gun, whether it's on the lap or whether it's pointed. Obviously, you point a gun like this, it's much less likely to be an accident. Uh, but still, I mean, you can still fire the gun this way uh, and would be consistent with murder if, in fact, he's squeezing the trigger on purpose. But I'll counter that with this question. If he wanted to shoot and kill his wife, why would he shoot in that manner? Is he a diabolical genius that knows, well, if I hold the gun like this, when they bring in a crime analyst later on in trial, they'll know that I had it on my lap. But otherwise, if he just held it upright, he, it's no, he knows he could kill her there. But again, that shot didn't kill Diane immediately. She was rushed to the hospital. She had the opportunity to speak to people in the emergency room. There was a, Danny Joe Carter was driving the car. This was in a public area. And again, I got to ask you the question, if you were going to sh intentionally shoot and kill your wife, unless you're a diabolical genius, would you do it in this way? Well, in that argument, and Bob, you know that argument comes up all the time, right? We, 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 you know, if you're going to commit the perfect murder, we wouldn't do X, Y, and Z. And every defense attorney in every case makes that same argument. And I reply the same way. We don't catch the real smart ones, Jesse. You know what? The, the perfect murderers don't get caught. The ones who get caught are the ones who make mistakes, like this guy, and he made a mistake. That's the way I respond to those arguments each and every time. I, Bob, I, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I don't think you made a mistake because we're here talking about it. And if we're here talking about which expert to believe or not believe, then you can be assured that in the jury room, the jury's going to be talking about it. And if they can't come to a conclusion one way or the other after listening to both the state's expert and the uh, defense expert, uh, I see pain for the prosecution on the murder charge. And I, I will say, and, and I'm not disagreeing with what's being said, but... I agree from the beginning of this, there is a cockamamie factor to this. You've got a one round shot, one round opportunity to kill your wife that you're planning and plotting. You're getting in a car with this other witness that's in there and you decide, let me just shoot it a little bit on a downward angle through a car. Maybe it'll hit her. Maybe it won't. It's just not the way that when, when we were talking before about common sense, I don't think a jury is going to find that that is a diabolical common sense thing to do. I just think that it, it's just not going to work for them. Well, I'll tell you this much, this conversation that we're having here on set is definitely the conversation that the jurors will be having. And that's really the point, isn't it, is, is to have this conversation. And that's why I think that the work by both the prosecution and the defense, they've done a great job creating that conversation in the minds of the jurors. And I don't think it's going to be uh, an easy job for them, but that's what they will ultimately have to do. Now, I want to continue playing the testimony of Ross Gardner because he was an important witness, whether you believe what he, his analysis or not. It creates a conversation, and that's really what we're doing here. So what I want to do is continue playing the testimony of Ross Gardner, a witness called by the defense to talk about the shooting on the day of the, the shooting. Welcome back, everybody. We're waiting for the live feed to start up in the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia, excuse me, a prominent attorney who's on trial for shooting and killing his wife, Diane MacGyver. Now, what you just saw was the testimony of Ross Gardner, a crime scene analyst testifying for the defense. And right there in that particular piece of testimony was about how the models presented by the state 
don't make sense based upon the size and positioning of the defendant. Now, we talked about this earlier with Vinnie Politan, host of the live feed on 11alive.com. Vinnie, you were talking about that. Now, Ross Gardner is saying, well, if you want to put him sideways, then you got to tilt him up. It doesn't make sense based upon the state's uh, models. So you have a, an expert criticizing the state's models that were used. What did you think about that? And what do you think the jury's thinking about that? Well, it actually happened both ways because there were some uh, demonstrative uh, photographs that were taken uh, by this defense expert. And then you recall the cross-examination of him pointed out that he's using a gun that is a different length than the actual gun. He's using his arms, which are obviously a much different length than Tex MacGyver's arms. So on both uh, perspectives, you, you have issues. Again, uh, you know, the prosecution expert was very clear about uh, their testimony and how it made sense from their perspective. Uh, it happens in every trial. I think that the jury will take a look at both of them, figure out what they like or what they don't like. But I think, again, this comes back down to common sense. And those jurors aren't going to get to sit in the SUV, but they're going to try to reenact it and figure it out in their chairs in the jury room and, and have this common sense type argument and take it out of the realm of the, of the experts because of this inconsistency in their two conclusions. Vinny makes a great point. It really is about common sense, not just with this trial, but with all the trials. So, Bob, when you look at Ross Gardner, is it common sense what he's saying? Or does Vinny make a good point that you could try to see it both ways, both from the state or from the defense? How do you think about with this battle of experts again? Like I said before, uh, and I agree with Vinny completely, when you have a, a battle of the experts and there is no definitive way for the jury to make a determination as to who's being accurate or not, to me, they cancel each other out. Remember the case of O.J. Simpson? That was a battle of the experts. And what ultimately did the jury do there, where they could not come to a reasonable doubt conclusion? And if you remember that case, to go to Vinny's point about common sense, which I agree with completely, Jesse, the jury was not given the evidence of the car ride, the flight in the white Bronco. I'm just using this as an example with Al Cowlings and a 10000 in cash, a ski mask and a gun. Because any good prosecutor would have taken that singular piece of evidence, forget about the experts, it would have appealed to the common sense juror and said, is that that the way an individual whose children have just been orphaned uh, would respond mm -hmm. to knowing that Nicole had been killed. When the jurors had heard that piece of evidence afterwards, and of course this is not exact, they said that would have been a compelling reason to have convicted. Why was it excluded? So to Vinny's point, I agree with common sense completely. And here, look, it's amateur hour. The, it's not just that the prosecutor's, prosecution's expert is contradicting the defense. What I love about this, and I drive a stake as a defense lawyer through the heart of the prosecutor here, is they're not even using replicas that are accurate. They're not even using the weaponry or, or, the, or, the, or the ammunition that was supposedly used in this particular case. So you can't even trust the assumptions upon which that expert, what, what are you doing here? I'd be saying this is amateur hour. Why did the prosecutors put this kind of expert on like this when they didn't even replicate it properly? It's garbage. It's junk. Bob, you make a good point about trust. You want to be able to trust uh, each side. You want to be able to trust the state and you want to be able to trust the defense. Now, Vinny, my question is, uh, we're not just talking about Ross Gardner, we're also talking about, you mentioned it earlier, Annie Anderson, the masseuse. And as you said, there might be testimony today to attack her credibility. Um, what you heard in our preview package, and what if anybody was watching her ta uh, testify last week, she said, I felt a little bit of pressure from the state. And you were asking me uncomfortable questions. And, and the jury heard that. So when the, then the, the prosecution's put in a place where they're saying, oh, I'm not saying it was an affair, it wasn't an affair, the idea that the jury heard a witness say that she felt pressured, uh, that can't be good for the state. Well, but I, I, again, I would come back to some, some, again, reasonable expectations. You are in the bedroom with the man who just shot his wife. She just died that day and you're spending the night in the bedroom with her and witnesses came in and testified about all of that about witnessing that yes yeah, she was in the bedroom with them all night you know why what exactly is going on here now she had a a reasonable explanation for all of that if if you buy it but it's not a a normal situation that people have that type of relationship with their masseuse i mean if if, if any anyone goes out and gets a massage how many of them have that close of a relationship with their masseuse that they're the person that you go to on the darkest day of your life. 
So all of that needed to be explored by prosecutors. So I don't think that'll be held against them because this is really a strange, strange situation. Bob, you got to agree. Um, come on, the, the, the masseuse is kind of taking charge of the man who just shot his wife? So, it's so, a so bizarre Vin, world. You know Vinny, I, Vinny makes a great point, and the defense will say, and what you've heard them say is, there's no guidebook on how to react uh, after a murder. But, 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 but Vinny makes a great point. Who acts like this? Okay. Who does the things that textbook guy First off, I will repeat. I, as a judge, would exclude this under evidence rule 403, typically used in most states, as being the prejudicial impact of this versus the probative effect. What is the motive here? Is it financial or is it that he's having an affair with the masseuse? Is it a combination of those things? And when you have the prosecutor telling you, I can't really directly prove that there was a relationship, you are asking the jury now to speculate. That is point one. Point two is that's how the defense will have to explain it away because, unfortunately, the judge let that in. I personally, if I were a judge, would not have let that evidence in. But but to the point that we were talking about, about how that looks to the prosecution, to the jury, that she was saying that I was being uh, kind of attacked or prevailed upon and crying while you were crossing, when you were asking me questions as a witness, I do not think that that's good. And having been a prosecutor sitting in those seats, I don't want a witness saying that because you know what? It's consistent with what his personality is in the courtroom. And the jurors are going to, I think, understand based upon the way that this prosecutor has acted inside the courtroom, that is very likely what she was saying. Uh, is, is accurate about what was going on behind the scenes. Why is this important? Because the defense, if they're good, are going to say they, they put a square peg and a round hole in this case, and they badgered and beat any witness down that didn't confirm their theory and just accepted a bunch of junk science, junk experts or whatever, simply to save face because they overcharged this case. That's why I think it's really relevant. I don't want to hear a witness say that I'm, I'm being unfair and I'm being overpowering to them. It's just not good testimony. The witness testimony throughout this case has been important to listen to. And again, we're talking about uh, Ross Gardner. We're talking about Annie Anderson. Now, Vinny, I want to stand by because I'm about to uh, I'm going to play some more of Ross Gardner's testimony. But you mentioned a point before about the jurors being able to examine the SUV. We're going to I do want to let our viewers know that the jurors will get to see the SUV later today. Vinny, I will get your thoughts on this. I do want to show a little bit more of the testimony of Ross Gardner. But then I would definitely want to hear from Vinny Tolleton about the ability of the juror to, jury to see the SUV as well as potentially handling the gun. But in the meantime, here is the testimony of Ross Gardner. Welcome back, everybody. We're waiting for the live feed in the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta, Georgia, an attorney who's on trial for shooting and killing his wife, Diane MacGyver, and he faces also one count of influencing a witness, and that witness is the driver of the car where this whole sh shooting took place. I want to bring back in Vinnie Politan. Uh, Vinnie, we talked earlier, and you brought up the fact that the jury... Uh, the jury will have an opportunity today to examine the SUV. SUV. We also know that they will have the opportunity to handle the weapon. That's right, the 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. They will be able to handle that in the jury room. The jury being allowed to handle and examine these pieces of evidence, what do you think of it? Uh, I love it. I, I think we do too much in our criminal justice system to shield the jury uh, from the truth and to shield them from all the evidence. And obviously there's rules of evidence, there's a constitution, I understand it. Uh, but I think we kind of take it a little bit too far. Uh, this is great that they get to handle the weapon. We want, they're the ones who got to figure out what happened here. Give them an opportunity to try to figure out what happened. Now, when it comes to the SUV, um, we saw this in the hot car death murder trial that we covered down here as well, where the, the car was brought to the courthouse and the jury came around. The jury was not allowed to get inside the vehicle. Uh, but they were able to look from the outside. I think it's so important for them to see the scene where this happened. Uh, I mean, this ultimately is what it's all about, and, and the jury has to understand it's not exactly the way it was, but give them some idea, some perspective, because we asked them to do something that seems so difficult, to try to figure out exactly what ha happened here. When you have two sides arguing completely opposite things, give them the tools to do it. Again, I'm here with Bob Bianchi. Bob, what do you think the dangers of allowing the jury to examine this evidence is? I'm in accordance with Vinny. I, I, I've never really seen, you know, things have changed in 30 years. When I first started doing homicide cases, if I wanted the jury to see the gun or the knife and have it in the jury room uh, or any other evidence for that matter, to touch it, feel it, to debate about it, uh, it was automatically allowed. It was a piece of evidence introduced during the course of the trial. What started to happen, just so you understand, Jesse, the history of this was that uh, arguments were made and courts were accepting and buying that sometimes a thing like a gun or a witness statement could be so 
persuasive and that the jury would not be looking at the totality of the evidence, but rather that specific piece of evidence. And there have been cases in which, crazy as it may sound, mm -hmm. weapons have been fired, even though they were supposed to be disabled and, and not uh, in jury rooms. So then it went to a point where they weren't letting them in at all. Recently, my experience has been what they're doing is, is that if the jury wants to see it, they'll bring the weapon in for the period of time that they need to examine it, and then when they're done examining it, they'll take the weapon out. I don't know if the judge is going to do it, but I, I substantially agree with Vinny that let the jury have the most important pieces of evidence and, and let them decide how and for how long they want to be able to review that evidence. I wonder how the fact that we're not entirely sure if the gun was in single action or double action mode and whether or not the jury knows that or knows how to manipulate the gun in that way will become a factor in how they examine it. We'll, uh, we'll have to see. But, uh, Vinny, I want to ask you another question. Um, so one of the rebuttal witnesses that will be called today is the state-hired uh, sleep expert. They're going to bring in their own sleep expert. Now, we know the defense called their own sleep expert to testify to the fact that Tex MacGyver did have a sleep disorder. We know that Annie Anderson, the masseuse, said that he would fall asleep pretty easily every time. Um, he would wake up uh, startled a little bit. And uh, we're going to talk about those sleep experts in a minute, Vinny, so stand by. Um, I do want to show a little bit more of the uh, testimony right now. Um, actually, you know what, I'm getting a, a report that we have a live feed right now in the courtroom. So let's go. I think we have a three box. We can show it. I, I want to see who's on the stand right now. Uh, okay, everybody, let's go right now to the courtroom. Okay, so that's Jay Grover. He's being uh, examined by the uh, attorneys outside of the presence of the jury to determine his, what his testimony would be. I want to bring in again a uh, host of the live feed on 11alive.com, Vinny Politan. Vinny, what are you making of this about Jay Grover potentially being able to testify? You know, when I was down at the courthouse last week, uh, I sat in the same row as Jay because he's been inside the courtroom. And I, and I was wondering why he was taking notes. Well, that became a, a lot clearer just a few moments ago. Uh, that he's been uh, texting back and forth and, and comparing uh, the testimony of, of some of the witnesses to what he knows to be the truth. What folks have to know is he, he works for uh, Corey Industries, which is the, the company that Dan MacGyver uh, worked for, and that whole group sits together inside the courtroom, and they have really become Diane MacGyver's family, like the victim's family inside the courtroom. They're in there with Danny Joe Carter's in the middle of all of them. And he was taking notes, so at this point, um, it, it seems like he is less of an independent witness as to someone who now seems to be, in a certain respect, working for prosecutors, which could help prosecutors get some information and learn some stuff. But if this comes out in front of the jury, it's not going to make him look great, I don't think. I'm here again with long crime trial analyst Bob Bianchi. Bob, isn't there something inappropriate about that? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing inappropriate with an expert that is advising the prosecution of facts that they're learning and how to ask questions. I've actually done that myself. What is inappropriate is typically you don't want witnesses that have testified in a courtroom if they're going to be recalled to testify because it could taint their testimony. It's a little different with experts because experts are allowed to offer opinions, and so facts given to them um, can be fed to them while they're on the witness stand. But this I guy's agree not even an it. expert. Yeah, it just looks. It's just if this gets out in front of the jury uh, again, yeah. I go back to it's just one more piece of radiation to the prosecution's case of either amateur hour or uh, foul play or just doesn't look good. I mean, how many more of these instances can the prosecution stumble on? And there are unforced errors that are happening over and over again. If this guy was prosecuting, I mean, no disrespect to the guy. He's trying to do a job. I get it. I was the boss of many assistant prosecutors. I love that job. I love that field. But um, I would seriously consider giving this guy a homicide case again based on some of these unforced errors that I'm seeing. Well, let's see. Uh, we're going to go back live into the courtroom in the Claude Tex MacGyver case. Sorry. Okay, as they try to understand a little bit more about what this test witness will ultimately testify to, I want to talk to Vinny Politan. Vinny, we also know that one of the other rebuttal witnesses that may be called today is uh, forensic CPA Dean Driscoll, who talked about Tex MacGyver's deteriorating financial position. Now, the defense tried to battle that back with their own witnesses talking about Tex MacGyver's interest in a mining company. What do they want to get out today? What is the state trying to leave in the minds of the jury in terms of Tex MacGyver's financial situation? It's pretty simple, and the theory is pretty simple, that Tex MacGyver is better off with Diane MacGyver dead. He was worth um, was his bank account, his liquid assets were like minus 5000 before she died. After she died, he's up to like $4 million. So the bottom line, they want to uh, make this jury understand that Tex MacGyver was better off 
financially with Diane dead. He had control of the money, didn't have to ask permission, didn't have to get a favor. The money was his to do whatever he wanted. So he had the freedom plus the money. Remember, the defense is going to argue that, well, when Diane dies, you know, that she was the one generating all the revenue for the couple. However, the Tex MacGyver always had to ask for money. So I think the argument has to be a, a, a level of financial freedom for Tex MacGyver, that he had the money and could do whatever he wanted with it. Now, Bob, you've been awfully critical of the prosecution's financial theory case. Vinny makes a good point, though. Financial freedom, don't be beholden to your wife. Uh, she was teasing him about his um, financial situation. He was, his financial situation was deteriorating uh, continually as the years went on. He had to ask her for a loan. He had to keep up the expenses of the ranch. There was a conversation about whether or not he was even going to get the property after she died. What do you say to the financial motive in this case as articulated by Vinny? I, I've said this before, Jesse. I think the financial motive in the case, if you're going to go there, needs to have very strong direct or circumstantial evidence to show that, in fact, he was angry, agitated, that it was of such a significant significance it would cause one to kill. I just have not heard that in this case. I mean, it's great to throw it out there. Like I said, you can just throw it out there. But everyone has financial situations. Everyone, somebody may be more powerful. Than that. Most people do not commit murder under the circumstances. And they don't commit murder by going into a car where another woman is driving who is, who is a witness with a gun that's in the console say, give me the gun in the back seat as they get off an off-ramp of a vehicle, fire one shot in the lower part of it, take her to a hospital and have her say it was just an accident. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, could it be? Yeah, but that's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt to me. At the end of the day, though, we know that Tex MacGyver is the shooter, and we know that he was the one who ultimately killed Diane MacGyver, and the jury can't forget that, but the question becomes, what was going on in the mind of this man? Was this intentional, or was this an accident? I want to go back live into the courtroom right now. Jay Grover is on the stand. He is somebody that worked with the victim. He will be recalled, or they're determining if he will be recalled as a witness. Let's go live into the courtroom. All right, everybody, we're waiting for the live feed in the courtroom to begin again. Uh, they're just working on some witnesses that will be called today, some administrative matters outside of the presence of the jury, and the jury will be eventually called in. Uh, again, I'm here with Bob Bianchi, law and crime trial analyst, as well as via Skype, host of the live feed on 11alive.com, Vinny Politan. Now, Vinny, uh, one of the interesting things about the case has been the conversations that happened at the hospital. And we saw the, the testimony of Blair Brown, and she was a nurse that night, and she said, look, I didn't hear um, Mr. MacGyver say anything about cleaning his gun in a sink and it went off, which is something that was heard by another nurse. Now, the defense, I think, did a very good job at really attacking the credibility of some of these nurses and say that they were biased toward, against Mr. MacGyver from the start. But what did you think about the whole emergency room situation and what happened at the hospital? Again, it, it's totally bizarre because you've got him calling his attorney right away, okay? And, and nothing against attorneys. And, you know, you shoot someone and they're in a the hospital, there may be some issues. But that seemed to be on the top of Tex MacGyver's mind. So that is very unusual to begin with, right? And your wife is accidentally shot, and you've got the counsel of your attorney, who is not really a great friend, had never been out to the ranch or anything else. So all of that is really strange. And I think the nurses uh, did the right thing by paying attention to what they're seeing and hearing. Um, but what was important for the defense um, was talking about that bathroom story that one nurse spoke about because that could be really problematic for prosecutors because a big part of their opening statement was all these different stories that were told uh, by the defendant. Well, was this or was this not another inconsistent story? Um, if no one else heard it, it I think it harms the, the credibility of that nurse's recollection of what happened that night. Either she misheard something uh, or made something up. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that, I mean, their testimony was really interesting. I think it lasted a, a, three days or even a week, everything that happened at the uh, hospital. Um, Bob, what did you think about what happened at the hospital? 
I think it's all over the place. Once again, I, I go back to the same thing. We were saying this last week when this testimony was coming out. Um, there are contradictory stories, and the judge will read at the end of the case an instruction to the jury, I believe, it's very powerful, that tells the jurors be very careful in scrutinizing oral statements or recollections of oral statements made by people because a change of a word, a change of a nuance, the change of a context of the situation can change the entire meaning. So be very, very scrutinizing of these communications. And again, I go back to the same thing. If you can't pin down definitively what was or wasn't said, that helps the defense. Well, the uh, closing arguments by both sides, as well as the jury instructions about how the jury will be instructed to deliberate is crucial in this case. Now, let's go back into the live feed. The judge is having some words with the attorneys. Okay, we want to break down what we just saw in the courtroom, uh, Judge McBurney talking about whether or not Jay Grover could be called as a witness and if there was an issue of him being in the courtroom listening to all of the testimony and being called as a witness to, talk to, to testify about the size of Diane MacGyver's uh, feet and her boots and it becomes a question of credibility of the masseuse. So again, I'm here with Vinnie Politan. Vinnie, I have a, just a general question. You've been following the case. You've been in the courtroom. What, did you make, what do you make of Judge McBurney's style? The, it's become a big issue in this case about his, um, his answers to certain questions, his overall demeanor. What do you make of him? I think he's a great judge. Uh, I think he's very open. He lets the attorneys make their arguments. He's been, uh, he keeps a great uh, demeanor inside the courtroom, has a great rapport with the jury, which is absolutely important uh, for a judge to have, keeping them engaged and involved in the whole process. And, and I think he's been fair. I mean, the defense can't argue that he's not fair. Uh, I mean, two of the counts of the indictment are gone. That never happens. So this guy calls him as he sees him and has been very, very fair. Let's, can we just talk about the boots for a second, Jesse? Yeah, I, I, want, because, I want to. Yeah, because, I, I, all right, so the, the masseuse testified that she's a size 10, okay? She said Diane MacGyver was a seven and a half, but now this witness is going to say, well, she's like an eight and a half, and I may have bought nine, size nine boots. So there's a couple questions. Can uh, um, Annie Anderson's size 10s fit in a size 9? And would, would Diane MacGyver's size 8 and a half fit in a 9? I mean, it, it's crazy. If the boot fits, are we supposed to acquit or not? Just the thing. It's, it's a clever title. It's a clever saying, and I'm glad you brought it up. But, but Bob, again, I'm here with Bob Bianchi, law and crime trial analyst. Bob, you're hearing what Vinny says. How does this fit into the overall arch of the case? We're talking about boots. No pun intended. Overall You're very arch. good. Nice. Very good, Jesse. Thank you. That was good. Uh, this is craziness that the prosecution's rebuttal witnesses are coming down to this. So I, I, I will just be the short... Bob Bianchi, short legal answer. It's ludicrous. It's meaningless. They're going to go to common sense. They're going to go to whether they could they could judge from the expert witnesses. This case is falling apart, in my opinion. I don't think that I don't think the jury is going to care less about this testimony. So we know that the judge will let Grover testify about the boots, but in a more limited scope than the state wanted. Um, again, we are seeing the conclusion of this case in its entirety. It's been a long case. Uh, it's many witnesses have been called. Um, Vinny, I'm curious, again, what does the state need to hammer down today before they enter into closing arguments tomorrow? All right, first, first things first, let's deal with the boots, right? Convince this jury that those boots were size nine or size 10 and that uh, Annie Anderson, the masseuse, was not 100% credible in her testimony. If she lied about one thing, maybe she lied about everything. That's the argument that you have to make there. Uh, when it comes to the sleep, I, that whole sleep testimony from the defense expert I thought was ridiculous. Talk about ludicrous. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with that. But I think the, the jury view of the vehicle is important as well, although I don't know what the, what the prosecution can do with it other than let them see it, and then make arguments based upon what they see. All right, and Bob, what does the defense need to do today as the prosecution calls their rebuttal witnesses? Uh, they, they're they in a good place, and when you stand well, stand still. Don't ask any kind of questions that are going to cross-examine your already solid case as a defense lawyer into a conviction. Um, so they, they want to coast the summations, the defense lawyers, in my opinion, and... 
uh, in, in, in summations, they want to go, that, that, that was the important rebuttal case you heard? That, that was like so important that you heard those last two or three witnesses? What did they exactly prove for you? That's, yeah. that's the strategy going forward. All right, the jury has come into the room. I want to sign off Vinny Politan. I know we don't have much more time, Vinny, so thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate your insight, and we can't wait to talk to you during closing arguments. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Easy. All right. Thanks, take Bob. it easy, Vinny. Thank you again. All right, everybody. Let's go back live into the courtroom right now.